So in terms of office planning, we, we talk about three different um, possible layouts for, for an office. And we discuss the advantages and differences between them. Now I'm presenting here some of the special areas that you might need in an office. Um, that includes conference meeting and training rooms, uh, shop offices, and the reception area. A conference room basically use dimension equipment, furniture, and illumina illumination requirements, as we have explained for other uh, spaces within the facility. Um, shop offices can be pre prefabricated with windows that allow people to monitor activity of the factory floor. Um, this may be used as storage sometimes. And finally, uh, the reception area, which most of us are familiar with, is um, security needs, a uh, number of visitors. So that's basically the front face of your facility. Um, so it provides access to, to most of the areas in the facility and also serve as security. And it has some furniture requirements. But we're not going to go in detail about that. Just wanted to let you know that there's other areas that are important in terms of uh, office planning. And finally, um, we need to talk about barrier-free compliance. So when you're designing um, some of these areas for your factory or for your facility, you need to take into account that there's um, some um, people with disadvantage in terms of uh, reaching and, and so on. So you need to design based on those requirements as well. So facilities planning must incorporate in the intent of the America with Disabilities Act into their design. And basically what this states in general is that disabled persons will have the same right as the able body to the full and free use of the facilities that serves the public. Um, a barrier is a physical object that impedes a disabled person's access to the use of the facility. Uh, for example, a door that is not wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair will be an example, or stairs without a ramp access to the facility. Um, so in terms of the design, you need to account for the handicapped person space uh, requirements versus of an able-bodied person. So um, we have here some of the requirements for a person on a wheelchair. So wheelchair dimensions reach and maneuverability requirements. Um, in terms of reaching, we have some um, measurements here. So from this height to this height, this three feet with nine inches. And also we have, we need to provide space in terms of the radius of the wheelchair. So we, for example, if we, this person goes to the, to the restroom, we need to provide enough space for the person to maneuver the, the wheelchair. So that radius is uh, five feet with three inches. Okay, so Keep that in mind, if that's the case, you have to comply with the Disabilities Act. Make sure that your facility accounts for the requirements for 
uh, people in wheelchair and with other disabilities. So any questions about this? Um, so that basically concludes our lecture on employees and personal requirements and interface between the employees and the facility. Now, um, we're going to transition to a different topic. This is called schedule design. And from here, we're going to use some of the things that we learned uh, on the first part of or the first material was covered in the in the first exam, specifically designing um, your production schedule in terms of the number of units that you need to produce if you have some defects units, and how that impact the number of machines that you need for your facilities. Why is this important? Because you no, know, the number of machines will affect the space that you're going to have available in your facility. So you need to know according to the production schedule that you're going to have or the number of units that you're expecting to produce, how many machines are you going to need because that's going to affect the space that you're going to have in your facility. So, um, so going back, I just want to keep in mind that we have some objectives, general objectives for this class and this particular uh, lecture will look at the Objective number two, which is learn formulation models and analytical procedures to, for the study of facilities layout planning. Okay, so for this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the topic, introduction, and then I'm um, going to explain how the marketing information allows you to uh, predict uh, the type of volume of production that you're going to need to satisfy in the future. Then we're going to talk about process requirement and the machine assignment process. So, learn how to plan for some of the equipment requirements into a facility, specifically uh, the number of machines is the learning objective for this lecture. And in terms of the introduction, um, I was saying schedule design decisions provides answers to questions involving how much to produce, and when to produce. So it's not the same that you, I mean, that you have to produce a thousand units or tomorrow, or having to produce the same number of units in two weeks. So timing is also important. Um, in addition to how much and when to produce, it's important to know how long the production will continue. And such a determination is obtained from market forecast. So you might have a product that will resume their production and you will produce them on several um, times during the year or you might have a product that will go the whole year, or you might have a problem with, you would just produce for, for one month of the year. So the long of the production is also an important factor when you're trying to decide how to schedule your production. Um, so to plan a facility, information is needed concerning the production volumes. trends, 
and the predictability of future demands. for the products to be produced. So again, in keeping information, historical information about your uh, products might help you to come up with some probability models in terms of forecasting what's going to happen in the future. Um, know some of you are familiar with uh, regression analysis, um, forecasting, those type of models are very important when you're trying to plan for your future demand and also for um, the type of resources that you're going to need in your facility. So the, the more specific the inputs from product process and schedule design the the greater the likelihood of optimizing the facility and meeting the needs for manufacturing okay so if you have a very accurate estimation of the volume of units that you should expect to produce in that facility then that should give you a good understanding of the resources, in this case, the number of machines that you're going to need for your facility. Um, on that picture right there, I'm just going to show you how a schedule for, for machines would look like. You look at the computer screen. Depending on the type of software that you use, um, this might look different, but this is um, usually this bar chart is what you observe when you're having a production schedule and you have multiple machines um, so this can tell you different things uh, colors might be used to to define the type of product so you have different products and then when you see those empty spaces that means that your machine is idle during those times so you might be able to accommodate more production into those uh, machines So in terms of marketing information, again, this information is important for you to be able to forecast the, the needs, or not necessarily the need, but the, the amount of products that you're going to be responsible for in your facility. And at the same time, that allows you to plan for your resources. So as a minimum, The market information given in this table one is needed, so you might need at least an estimate for the first 10 years, so depending on how long you plan to, to have this product running, and that should give you an idea of what the resources are needed for, for that particular product. So here we have four different products, and we have an estimation in terms of the market, how many units we should expect to sell uh, per year. So you see for this first product, there's a constant volume for the first two years and then the facility or the company is expecting to have an increment for the last uh, 10 years, five, 10 years. And then for product number two, there's a decrease. So by the 10 year, you will not produce that product. Um, then for product number C uh, or C product, you have a very constant demand. And then for the last one, you start with zero demand, but then you increase that demand as time goes. Okay, so there's different trends for different products in this uh, particular example. Um, ideally, and that's, this is not always the case, uh, having information such the one percentage in table number two will be great. Um, Instead of just showing you point estimates for each one of the years, we are also providing information about different scenarios. So, in scenarios divided in three 
three different scenarios, the one that is pessimistic, the one that is uh, most likely, and the one that is optimistic. So if everything goes well, then we expect to lose this many units. But if things don't go as we plan, then the minimum number of units that we should produce is 3,000. And then the most likely scenario is the one that is uh, kind of the expected value or, or the average. And we assign some probabilities to each one of those scenarios. So this probability to, for that particular product should always add to 1. So what we are saying is for product A, for the first year, These are the three possible things that can happen. And then we have the same type of estimation for the following. Okay, so we are adding some uncertainty to our estimates. And we can use such type of information to make more accurate decisions. Um, so again, uh, the difference between these two tables, we are just providing a point estimate for each one of the years in the first table, information. Um, but in this one, we are providing more detailed information about um, three different scenarios for each crop, according to, to the year. If such information is available, a facilities plan can be developed for each demand state. And a facility design with sufficient flexibility to meet the yearly fluctuations in product mix. So again, if we if we have such type of information and the one presented in table two, uh, we can design a facility with more flexibility because we are accounting for the uncertainty, the demand for the product. In addition to the volume, trend, and predictability of future demand or baddest products, the qualitative information listed in table 3 should be obtained. So here we are ask, asking some questions um, to the marketing uh, people in the facility or in the, in the company. So for example, who are the customers or consumers of the product? And, and that can impact different areas of the facility. Uh, like packaging, we might be able to design a package for different type of cost consumers, uh, susceptibility to product changes, and susceptibility to change in marketing strategies. Uh, where are the consumers located? That will affect your location, the location of your facility, um, the method of shipping, so you might be able to send that by mail or probably have to uh, have some trucks to to send those products. Uh, warehousing system design. So if we have large products, and that would also uh, change the strategy that you have for sending those products. Um, why will the consumer purchase a product? Is that affected by seasons or variability in sales? strategies in terms of marketing, if you are having sales, you're having coupons and so on. Where will the consumer purchase the product that will determine the size of the lot and also your storage requirements and so on. So 
as you can see, there's very important information that is quantitative in terms of the future demand, market um, predictability, and also there's some qualitative information that is also important. Okay, so that being said, we can talk now about the process requirements. So the specification of process requirements typically occurs in three phases. So the first phase determines the quantity of the components. That must be produced, uh, including allowances for defective items in order to meet the market estimate. So we saw how we can account for defective items when planning for the number of units that we need to produce for, for a facility or for a specific uh, demand. So that's something that we already discussed in the first um, first couple of lectures in this course. Uh, the second phase determines the machine requirements. For each operation. So that's what we're going to learn today, how to plan for once you have the number of units that you need to produce, how many machines do you need to produce that number of units? And the third phase combines the operation requirements to obtain uh, overall machine requirements. So third phase, operation requirements to obtain the overall machine requirement. Okay, so first we determine the number of units or components that we need in, in our production. So we're going to take into account the amount of defective units that might happen during the process. Once we have that amount, we need to know how many machines are we going to need to satisfy that production requirement. And then we're going to combine those two uh, for our schedule. So to address each one of those points, the estimation of the number of machines required begins with the identification of the machine use by individual operations. So here we're going to talk about the machine fraction for an operation and that's determined by dividing the total time required to perform the operation by the time available to complete the operation. Okay, so the machine fraction for an operation is determined by dividing the total time required to perform the operation by the time available to complete the operation. And the total time required to perform an operation is the product of the standard time for the operation and 
the number of times the operation is to be performed. Okay, so we're going to see how to apply this with a simple example on the next slide, but there are the two important uh, amounts that we need to consider. So, for example, if it takes 0.5 hours to process one part, and if the six parts are to be made in two hours, then it follows that 1.5 machines are needed to complete the operation. So you have only two hours to complete these six units. So in one machine you can only complete four. So that means that you need an extra machine to complete the other two. So that's why this 1.5, what that 1.5 means. You need two hours of one machine and then one hour for the second one. Um, whether or not 1.5 machines are actually adequate to complete all six parts depends on the following. Um, are the parts actually being made to the 0 0.5 hour per part standard time? Meaning that if there's any uncertainty that will change that, or not, if not, then we, we are sure that it will take only half an hour to complete each part. Um, the other question is, is the machine available? when needed during the two hour period so that basically goes back to this picture here now sometimes Okay, you say I need the, the machine for two hours, but this might be your schedule. So it will be very hard for you to find the machine that you need for a two-hour period. So that's the second question. And the third one, are the standard time the number of parts and the time the machine takes
known with certainty. And fix over time. And that question is most of the time um, answered with a no because most of the machines will require some type of setup. So that will increase the time that you, you're going to have to plan for when you're scheduling your, your components. Um, you might need some kind of maintenance uh, after you're done with the or cleaning, after you're done producing a, a part. Um, some of the components for, for a particular part might be effective. So if we, we know how to plan for that. So you know there's several things that can affect your, your production. So going back to each one of those questions, are the parts actually being made to the 0.5 hour per part start standard time? Um, this is mostly handled by dividing the standard time by the historical efficiency of performing the operation. So one more time, having historical data about your process might help you to plan better. So in this case, we can look at the reliability <clears throat> in terms of what's the time that it usually takes for you to, to complete that component. Then the second question is, is the machine available when needed during the two hour period? This is handled by multiplying the time the equipment is available to complete the operation by the historical reliability factor for the equipment. And the reliability factor is the percentage of time the machine is actually producing. So again, historical data is important. Um, there will be some machines that are older than other ones. That might take some time. Those might fail often. So all those things are also important. It's not only the process, but the type of equipment that you are using. Um, are the standard time, the number of parts, and the time the machine takes with known with certainty and fixed over time? Um, if considerable uncertainty and variation is fixed over time, it might be useful to consider using probability distributions. instead of point estimates for the parameters and utilizing a stochastic machine fraction model. So the difference between these two, again, we saw something like that in one of the tables for the marketing. When you have a point estimate, you're saying so I'm planning my production schedule for next week, and I'm saying, okay, uh, I'm going to produce 1,000 units because that's what's going to happen. That's what we call a point estimate. But you know that there are several things that are going to affect that number. So you're not accounting for any uncertainty for that estimate. You're just saying, I'm going to produce 1,000 because that's what I'm going to expect. But that's not always the case. So when you, when you have some variation in terms of the expectation for your production schedule, it's more better to use some um, probability distribution. You can use the expected value. You can use an average, uh, a weighted average. So the example that we show here, there were three scenarios. We're saying that most likely it's going to happen this. Um, the pessimistic and the optimistic is one way to do that. So you have a percentage or a probability for each one of these scenarios and you plan basically using that uncertainty. So instead of producing a thousand, you might say, oh, you know something, the probability of 
how many thousand are very small, so I will produce less than that. Okay, and I will use that extra uh, capacity to produce other products. Um, but typically, such models are not used, and the approach taken is to use a deterministic model. and plan the facility to provide sufficient flexibility to handle changes in machine fraction variables. So what we are saying is maybe what you need is a facility that will allow you to produce a thousand units per day, but since you are not going through the process of taking into account the uncertainty in our products, we're going to design our facility to produce um, 1,500. So we're going to overestimate so we can have some flexibility in terms of adding or changing our production schedule. Okay, so this is what happens most often. So we don't go through the process of analyzing and maybe don't have the information on hand. So the easiest way to, to plan for the facility is just by overestimating and adding some extra capacity for uh, flexibility. Um, so, the following deterministic model can be used to estimate the machine fraction required. So, machine fraction basically is the number of machines. Um, this might be a fraction number most of the time. To, uh, to plan for the production, so this is the, the formula where F stands for the number of machines required per shift. S is the standard time in minutes per unit produced. Q is the number of units to be produced per shift. E is actual performance expressed as a per percentage of the standard time. H is the amount of time in minutes. So again, units, it's very important. We are going to keep our units in minutes available per machine. And finally, R is the reliability of machine, expressed as percent of uptime. So in this expression, the numeration, numerator stands for the total time required per shift. And the denominator indicates the total time that one machine is available per shift. And on the next slide, we're going to show an example. To calculate the number of machines required, so a machine, machine part has a standard machining time of 2.8 minutes per part on a milli, milli machine, and during an 8-hour shift, 200 units are to be produced. Of the 480 minutes available for production, the milli machine will be operating, operational 80% of the time. And during the time the machine is operational, parts are produced at a rate of equal to 95% of the standard rate. So the question is how many milling machines are required? So what I'm going to do is, using this information, I'm going to start listing the parameters for my expression. So. The standard time per unit, that's S, what will be that time? What is the standard time per unit? That's correct, that's 2.8 minutes 
per part then we have Q which is the number of units to be produced in one chip so that is 200 then we have H which is the amount of time in minutes available per machine so that's 480 we also have the actual performance E expressed as a percentage of time so the actual performance here is 95 percent 0.95 and then finally the reliability of the machine it's right here it's gonna be 80 percent operational with 0 0.8 So using this information, then we can solve for F. So F equals S times Q divided by E times H times R. So this is 2.8 times Q, 200, divided by 0 0.95 times 480 times 0.8 and this is telling you that you need 1.535 machines per shift to satisfy that production for one chip Okay, so now I'm going to pass you a lab that you're going to work just related to this topic. But for this, you're going to need an extra step, meaning that you need to use some of the things that you learned in class already. Um, specifically, um, when you take into account the backup units, how many, how, how much will be your initial input? that type of So I have extra copies of the exercise. If any of you want an extra copy, let me know.
Thank <laughs> you. 